uh, for Monday, December 19th, 2018. And the time is, what do we got? Or it's Wednesday, <laughs> 19th, thank you. And the time is 10 o'clock. I'll just say. Uh, the first item on the agenda is a city council modification scope determination for Marcus Garvey Village, large scale general development. Anthony, Anthony Grande is here to describe the proposed modifications. Commissioners, um, the City Council has proposed modifications to the Marcus Garvey Apartments application, uh, which is here for scope review today. Uh, as a reminder, there were six land use actions with this application. Uh, the zoning map amendment um, remains unchanged, and uh, the zoning text amendment actually uh, should say there is also modified by the Council. Um, the zoning text amendment uh, was modified to remove option two and add the deep affordability option. And uh, number three, the, the bulk waivers with the large scale uh, general development was modified by the City Council, which I'll describe just uh, briefly in just a moment. And number four, the parking waiver special permit was uh, also modified by the city council. Um, the CPC approval uh, waived all of the parking spaces, so, so none were required. Um, the city council modification uh, leaves a requirement of 68 uh, parking spaces, which would be located in buildings um, A, F, and G. And the last two actions remain unchanged. Uh, as a reminder, this was the proposed development uh, that was approved by uh, the commission. It included seven new buildings, um, A through G, with a total of 724 units, which would be 100% uh, affordable. Um, there are three sort of different types of council mods uh, regarding the uh, bulk waivers. So I'll just describe each three types. So one is uh, base height and setback changes to buildings A, F, and G. So essentially portions of the buildings have reduced uh, base heights from seven stories to five stories. And then uh, portions of the buildings also have a slight increase in um, the, the size of the setback. And then building height, uh, three of the buildings, uh, B, F, and G had uh, one floor uh, reduced in height, so the ninth floor was, was removed from buildings F and G, and the eighth floor was removed from building B. And finally, um, there was a uh, distance between buildings, um, a change to the waiver to add distance uh, between proposed and existing buildings. So at D and E, uh, there were existing Marcus Garvey buildings that are adjacent um, to the proposed buildings and the city council is requiring an additional five feet uh, for the buildings to be moved from the existing buildings. And then also after the fifth, <laughs> fifth floor, an additional 10 feet um, sort of set back uh, from the existing buildings to create uh, sort of a transition. Uh, the city council's modifications will result in uh, reduced square footage of the overall development and a decrease in the unit count to 676 units, as well as a change in the non-residential square footages um, shown on the slide. Thank you. So I would ask if there are any questions from the commission about the changes? Yes, Commissioner Levin. Anthony, could you remind us um, how many units were involved when the CPC approved this? How many how many affordable units are being lost as a result of the so changes? So it, it was proposed to be 100 percent affordable. So right. the 724 was 724. Yeah, and now we're 676. 676. So it's a 48 unit difference. Yes, Commissioner Delos. Can I just get a better understanding of um, the rationale behind the parking, adding it back in? 
Um, yeah, I mean, there was a discussion about parking uh, when this came to the community board. So I know there were concerns about the loss of parking. I mean, the waiver was 294 spaces. So uh, I think the community just asked for retaining some of that parking for this, this large development. What's the top AMI level? Do you, do you remember off the top of your head? I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I think it's 80%. So the applicants presented a, a uh, AMI breakdown previously that showed essentially an ELLA framework. So um, they had deep affordability units and 60%, and I think 80% might have been the highest. Okay. I guess we'll, uh, it'll be interesting to see if it's actually utilized. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, then I'll ask for an assent by a show of hands to send the City Council a letter letting them know that the modification is in scope. Thank you. Good okay, morning. the second item on the agenda is a City Council modification for scope determination uh, for the 29 J Street rezoning. Uh, Kevin Kraft is here to describe the proposed modification. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, the City Council made a recommendation to modify 29 J Street, which is located in the Dumbo Historic District and Community District 2 in Brooklyn. As you may recall, the applicant has proposed a zoning map amendment from M14R8A to M16R8X within the Special Mixed Use District and a text amendment to facilitate a commercial development in Dumbo. The City Council is recommending a modification to the text amendment that will limit the bulk envelope of residential development in R8X districts within the special mixed use district to that of an R8A. Um, the department has reviewed the proposed modification and has determined it is within scope. However, the modification will not affect the proposed development as is. Happy to take any questions. Vice Chair Knuckles. I'm sorry, the last uh, phrase you said, however the it, it won't affect the proposed development. Um, they're proposing a commercial building. This would only affect a residential building. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, then a show of hands for the same modification letter. Thank you. Uh, the third item on the agenda is a city council modification scope determination for the M1 hotel text amendment. Uh, Barry Dinnerstein is here to describe the proposed modification. Good morning. Um, we have a couple of slides we're waiting to. Ah, okay. um, the city council uh, land use committee yesterday voted to uh, slightly modify the proposed uh, M1 zoning text, uh, hotel text amendment. Um, um, and they did a couple of things, one of which is in the proposal adopted by the commission, the areas outside the airports around JFK and LaGuardia Airport were exempt from the special permit. Um, the council chose to put those areas back and make them subject to the special permit. Uh, and that was considered as part of the A text that the commission heard at its public hearing. Um, although the commission did not uh, include that in the final uh, adopted uh, text, but the council put it back. Um, the second is the council chose to grandfather one project, a historic preservation project, uh, located in Brooklyn on Hall Street uh, near the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, as you can see, it's kind of a dilapidated um, uh, old sort of storage building which is proposed to be restored uh, as a combination office, manufacturing, and hotel. And the council uh, put in a special provision that would allow a hotel to proceed here um, uh, as of right. Uh, and the last thing the council did is it sort of clarified the findings uh, based upon some comments it had received from community boards. Uh, one was to uh, spell out that uh, in considering a special permit that uh, the commission look at their areas for refuse and laundry and how loading operations would work for the hotel. Um, and then also that in considering the uh, last finding, which is uh, impairing of essential character, that um, um, the commission consider 
um, impacts on uh, businesses in the surrounding area, uh, not limited to industrial businesses. Questions from the commission? Okay, then I'll ask for the show of hands again to send the modification letter. Thank you. The fourth item on the agenda is a city council modification scope determination for the special garment center text amendment. Dylan Sandler is here to describe the proposed modification. Good morning, commissioners. The proposed text amendment for the Special Garment Center District was adopted with modifications by the City Council Land Use Committee yesterday, December 18th. The modification would grandfather two sites from the hotel special permit that would um, be created throughout the Special Garment Center District. One is at 319 to 321 West 38th Street. The second property is at 317 to 319 West 35th Street. Both of these properties are located in subdistrict A2 in Community Board 4. That was the only recommended modification, and the proposal is scheduled to be voted on by the City Council tomorrow, December 20th. I'd be happy to take any questions from the Commission. Questions? Okay, so for the last time, I'll ask for a show of hands to send a scope letter to the Council. Thank you. Uh, this, I believe, concludes the uh, special review session for uh, Wednesday, December 19th, 2018. Uh, the time is 1014. And I will now welcome everyone to the City Planning Commission public meeting and ask Madam Secretary to begin. Good morning. This is the City Planning Commission public meeting held at NYC City Planning Commission here in room Lower Concourse 120 Broadway. Today is Wednesday, December 19, 2018. As a courtesy during the proceedings, we ask that you please turn off all cell phones and electronic devices. All speakers should fill out a speaker's card. In addition, we ask that those providing testimony please identify yourself, limit your remarks to three minutes, and speak clearly into the microphone. I will now call the roll. Chair Largo? Here. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Here. Commissioner Capelli? Here. Commissioner Cerullo? Here. Commissioner Dela Here. Commissioner Dweck? Here. Commissioner Edie? Here. Commissioner Knight? Here. Commissioner Levin? Here. Commissioner Marin? Yeah. Commissioner Ortiz? Here. <coughs> Commissioner Rampershed? Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of Wednesday, December 5th, 2018. On the minutes, all in favor? On Aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes are approved. Scheduling on calendar numbers one through five, we have resolutions for adoption. Scheduling Wednesday, January 9, 2019, for a public hearing to be held at NYC City Planning Commission hearing room, Lower Concourse, 120 Broadway. On the resolution, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The resolutions are adopted. <clears throat> the next part of the calendar is the report section on page eight. <clears throat> Borough of the Bronx, calendar number six and seven. Calendar number six, CD12, C180083, ZMX. Calendar number seven, N180084, ZRX. In the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning the East 241st Street zoning rezoning. For favorable reports on calendar number six and seven. <coughs> Chair Largo? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. With the expectation that this uh, project will ultimately include a handicap access facility, which is much needed at this particular uh, subway stop, I vote yes. Commissioner Capelli. I associate myself with uh, Vice Chairman Knuckles' remarks and vote yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Delaus. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Edie. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marin. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. <coughs> Commissioner Rampershed. Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers six and seven. Borough of the Bronx calendar numbers eight, nine, and ten. Calendar number eight, CD6, C190049, ZMX. Calendar number nine, N190050, ZRX. Calendar number 10, C190051, PPX. In the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments and for the disposition of city owned property concerning the Belmont Cove rezoning. For favorable reports on calendar numbers eight, nine, and 10. <coughs> Chair Largo? Yes. 
Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Commissioner Rampershit? Yes. <coughs> Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 8, 9, and 10. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar numbers 11 and 12. Calendar number 11, CD 3C180229, ZMK. Calendar number 12, N180230, ZRK. In the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning tax amendments concerning 895 Bedford Avenue rezoning. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 11 and 12. <coughs> Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Co I hope that the council modify it to focus just on MIH option one to better match the local AMI. Commis Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Commissioner Rampershed? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 11 and 12. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 13, CD 1C180439, ZSM, in the matter of an application for the grant of a special permit concerning 51 White Street. For a favorable report on calendar number 13, Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Commissioner Rampershed? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 13. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 14, CD 2C190070, ZSM, in the matter of an application for the grant of a special permit concerning 59 Greenwich Avenue for, adopt, for a favorable report on calendar number 14. Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Commissioner Rampershed? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 14. <coughs> Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 15, CD 3C190069, HAM, in the matter of an application for a UDAP designation, project approval, and disposition of city owned property concerning the East Village housing. For a favorable report on calendar number 15, <coughs> Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Refused. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Wright Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Commissioner Rampershed? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 15. Borough of Queens, calendar number 16, CD 13, C19004, MMQ, in the matter of an application for a city map amendment concerning the NYPD 116 precinct demapping. For a favorable report on calendar number 16, Chair Largo? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? <coughs> Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Commissioner Rampershed? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 16. Borough of, <coughs> excuse me, Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 17, CD 1C180514, PQR, in the matter of an application for the acquisition of property concerning DOT Staten Island Vehicle Maintenance and Repair Facility. For a favorable report on calendar number 17, Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Um, just in casting my vote, I would like to acknowledge the communication from uh, the Department of Transportation regarding the barbed wire fencing that um, uh, surrounds the facility and uh, their commitment to us that uh, that barbed wire would be removed upon the modification and updating of the fencing. And I would like to just recognize um, the report of this commission that references that letter and that language, and with that, I vote aye. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. 
Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Commissioner Rampershed? A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 17. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 18, CD3 N190142 RCR, in the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 252 Ramona Avenue for adoption on calendar number 18. Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Commissioner Rampershed? Yes. <coughs> calendar number 18 has been adopted. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 19, CD3 N190088 RCR, in the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 208. Sprague Avenue for adoption on calendar number 19. Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Commissioner Rampershed? Yes. Calendar number 19 has been adopted. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 20, CD3 N190090 RCR, in the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 570 Wainwright Avenue for adoption on calendar number 20. Chair Lago? Yes. Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Commissioner Rampershed? Yes. Calendar number 20 has been adopted. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing section on page 15. Borough of the Bronx, calendar numbers 21 and 22. Calendar number 21, CD 11, C180261 ZMX. Calendar number 22, N180262 ZRX. A public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning tax amendments concerning the Williams Bridge Road rezoning. We're going to have a 10-minute presentation by the applicant team comprised of Richard Lobel, Richard Vito, Anthony Pilla, and Joe Masha. Good morning, Chair, Commissioners. Richard Lobel of Shelton Lobel PC for the applicant. And we're here today to discuss the Williamsbridge Road rezoning. So the current rezoning area is um, bounded by three relatively well-traveled streets. It sits on Williamsbridge Road. The property itself is bounded by Williamsbridge and Colden Avenue, and Boston Road in, in addition runs past the property, which makes this a fairly transit-rich area. There's a number of bus lines which run adjacent to the property, uh, as well as the uh, two and five subway lines, with, which are probably within about half a mile. Uh, the current zoning of the property is C81. Of course, as the commission is aware, C81 is a relatively uh, low commercial district allowing for a one commercial FAR, uh, which has resulted in um, a, an area which has remained mostly unchanged, particularly with regards to the development site in this block. So you can see from the tax map the proposed area of the rezoning. The rezoning area uh, encompasses seven lots. Two of these lots are controlled by the applicant. So there's a, uh, a two-story building on the westerly portion of the uh, rezoning area, as well as a one-story garage on the easterly portion. There's a total lot area of about 8,700 square feet, which would be rezoned pursuant to the R7A C23 district and would permit redevelopment of a nine-story mixed-use residential and commercial building. Uh, as far as the additional lots are concerned, and we'll move over to the area map, uh, on the southern portion of the block, there's a triangular lot. This actually uh, has a, an existing non-conforming residential building. And this is kind of what sets the context for this block. The building itself is built uh, greater than the R7A district. It's built to roughly a 5.3 FAR uh, and is six stories. So it's out of compliance with regards to bulk and out of conformance with regards to use. Uh, while the R7A district would not result in a uh, an entirely complying building, the 4.6 FAR offered under the 
R7A district would cause the, this long-standing building to come closer to compliance. In addition to the residential building that exists on the southerly portion of the block, there's also four smaller properties. These are lots on Colden Avenue toward the northeastern portion of the dotted area. These are occupied by four uh, single to two family, three story buildings. These are residential as well. So when you look at the entirety of the rezoning area and what's done pursuant to this rezoning, we've got six lots which are either residential or mixed use which will be made conforming pursuant to the proposed rezoning with the one additional lot being the one story garage which is uh, of course an existing conforming use under the C81. So here you can see some photos of the surrounding area. Um, you can see in the lower left a, a, a picture of the existing two-story, um, first one-story in basement building with an existing uh, commercial use on the ground floor uh, and two residential units above. I would note that the Pilla family, who is the uh, um, applicant in this project, is uh, a construction company. They've had a long-standing construction company which is housed in this building. So pursuant to the rezoning, it's kind of a nice um, uh, development of the rezoning is that they'd be able to remain in the area. They would house their construction company. The offices would still operate from this site with the uh, eight stories of residential units being above that. This was seen as something as we went through our community meetings as being um, somewhat unique and also contributing to uh, the richness of this application. This is a family which has a long history in the Allerton area. Um, they've personally been involved in this property and on this property for close to 30 years. And so um, this would enable them to actually remain in the building and be on site uh, with regards to the operations of the building. Um, you can see the one-story garage portion is on the upper left uh, photograph, as well as the existing six-story rather large uh, F, uh, 5.3 FAR building in the lower right photograph. Uh, so I would just briefly note, oh, I would just briefly note prior to um, moving to uh, the discussion by Richard Vitto, the project architect, I know that the commissioners had some questions with regards to the building layout, including the uh, street wall on Allerton, on, I'm sorry, on Colden Avenue. I would just note that um, with regards to uh, AMI levels and the choice of affordability, this is not something which has been yet set. Um, the, uh, we've had discussions with uh, the council member and uh, of course have discussed option one and option two. Due to the nature of this building and the number of units in the building, the, the difference between the number of units is actually quite small. Uh, to, I think that option one would give us eight affordable units and option two would give us nine affordable units uh, at FARs uh, and, I'm sorry, at um, uh, adjusted um, income levels in accordance with HPD uh, uh, published guidelines. I would note, just make one additional note prior to handing the microphone over to Richard, is that the building itself actually in most of the materials is described as a 35 unit building. The number of units actually was reduced pursuant to conversations with the uh, Bronx Borough President, the, uh, they, they, were pref they had a preference for larger units, so the actual number of units decreased from 35 to 30. Uh, the percentage of two and three bedrooms increased, the size of the three bedrooms increased. This was all in accordance with both the Bronx Borough President's preference as well as their previously published guidelines. And so we actually ended up with a building which has more, you know, larger units and also as an, as an addendum, the existing parking space has remained the same. So in actual the 16 parking spaces provided, while originally amounting to less than 50% of the units, now amounts to a greater. And finally, I'd note that pursuant to uh, the existing zoning regulations, both pro before and after the rezoning, there would be no parking actually required at the site. This is being provided uh, in accordance with prior conversations with the community and with the former council member who had expressed a preference that parking be provided within this area. So I would hand the mic over to uh, Richard Vitto just to discuss some of the questions that have been raised by the commission. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Richard Vitto of OCV Architects. Um, So, um, as Richard explained, we uh, have a nine-story building that currently has uh, 30 units. Um, the lowest level, the cellar level of the building has, um, I'll just move through, um, has uh, parking, uh, which is accessed from Williamsbridge Road. There are 16 spaces, eight in one section of the building. and 
uh, eight more in the back along uh, Colden. Um, the first floor, which is also accessed from Williams Bridge, uh, has the offices of uh, the uh, client's construction company, as well as a uh, terrace that is accessed from Colden Avenue, providing uh, access to the uh, residential uh, lobby. Um, the upper floors are uh, for the second through the sixth floor. We have four units per floor, two one-bedroom apartments, a two-bedroom, and a three-bedroom. Uh, the Seventh and eighth floor have uh, five units, uh, four one-bedroom apartments and one two-bedroom apartment. The ninth floor provides a uh, a gym, exercise room, uh, and um, a terrace for uh, tenants occupancy. So um, that's a description of the. So, yes, if there are any questions. Are the other members of the applicant team going, going to be speaking or available for questions? They're available for questions. Great. Questions from the commission. Commissioner Deleuze. Uh, first, thanks for being here. Uh, just a couple questions. One is, um, so what are you all going to do in the interim while this is getting built with your existing offices? That's one question. We'll probably end up. If you don't mind, give the microphone. If you could also introduce yourself. My name's Anthony Pillar from the J Pillar Group. Uh, we'll probably lease a space. We have another building that we can use the basement in that in that area. Okay, great, appreciate. It. Okay. Yeah, and the other two questions, if I might, um, I, you know, at the review session on Monday, we had a lot of discussion about lot line windows and and such. I'm wondering if the architect can thoroughly describe that, um, and we, and also in the discussions uh, with the community board, if you can talk a little bit more, I know that the AMI issue is unresolved, but if there's a preference that you all have, it would be helpful to know that. So the lot line windows were just shown as um, an amenity. They're not used for light and air. There's no requirement. If anything is constructed adjacent to the building, the client understands that they would be lost. So, and it may be that when they finally go get around to doing it, they won't do them anyway. So it really was just something to show as an amenity. In terms of the AMI. Yeah. Um, the applicant actually at this point has no preference. Um, and the council member, while we've had previous discussions, um, understood the possibility of either option one or two. We're mapping option one and two, but uh, had, had at that time not, not selected a preference. So we're happy really to work with him and, and settle on a, uh, on an affordability level. Commissioner Ortiz. Um, hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, at the review session, we had some discussion. I, I understand this is a map change, but the, the rendering we saw gave a little cause for concern <coughs> um, along Colden, um, where, you know, this building really sits between two residential properties, um, and yet, as you can see, you know, it's a concrete wall and barrier that creates 50 feet of really nothing on the street, um, not necessarily conducive to a great pedestrian environment. Um, was curious sort of the rationale for that and, you know, if there was some or could be some consideration to sort of improve that condition. Uh, we could open it up, but I mean, what we showed was um, the, the terrace is, um, 30 inches above the Colton Avenue uh, sidewalk. And the reason for that is that we have to generate headroom for the parking areas below. So when we're coming in off of Williams Bridge Road, even though it is a two feet below, we still have to, we only have a certain amount of distance that we can really work with to get the ramps in, to get enough space below uh, the first floor level to get uh, headroom for the parking and do the terrace. So the the wall that we're seeing is actually uh, in front of a ramp, an accessibility ramp that allows you to get from the Colden Avenue level up to uh, the terrace for the residential entrance. 
Understood, but it creates a, a pretty inhospitable uh, condition we, on the street. For we could kind of look at doing something that would open it up and expose the ramp or do a planting. Or, I, it really, you know, we just <laughs> were showing the, the wall as something to uh, hide the ramp. Okay, I, I would I would certainly encourage that, and I think okay. you know residents should be concerned about that too. Fifty feet of a of a, a wall is not particularly comfortable to Understood. walk down. Um, and then, um, if you could speak to the on the to the land use rationale of allowing sort of commercial. I understand it's the commercial office space for um, the owner, but um, what the rationale is for allowing commercial along William, Williamsburg when again, you know, we sort of have a site. Uh, a uh, declining uh, number of uh, commercial spaces, you know, and then we get to residential and it seems like it's done, you know, mm -hmm. the commercial district is done. Um, but then we would have this building which has ground floor commercial um, again. So if you could sort of speak to that. Sure, I think I'd say uh, a few things in response. So first of all, you can see in the picture on the lower right that the existing uh, multi-story residential building on the corner maintains commercial use on the ground floor. So um, when discussing the rezoning options, it was seen as consistent with kind of this line here. Of course, this is a rezoning and so we're not tied to plans and we understand that um, the applicant here has an interest in maintaining their offices, but we believe that regardless of that, the commercial use would be appropriate given that uh, wraparound and that, that flavor uh, the commercial overlay here actually just extends along Williams Bridge and does not extend on Colden. It's for that 100 feet, so it was seen as being a benefit along that strip. I think the second thing we would note is that despite the rezoning of the uh, southerly portion of the block, the northerly portion of the block remains C81, and so you essentially are able to have as the right commercial uses along a small portion of Williams Bridge and Boston Road on the same block. So this uh, commercial overlay of C23 was seen as being consistent with that as well. And the other thing I'd note is that as you go uh, south, you see right along Allerton Avenue, immediately to the south of this block, you've got commercial overlays lining Allerton in the immediate vicinity of the block. So those three factors weighed heavily in the consideration here. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Levin. Um, yeah, I guess I have a, a, a comment and a, then a question about the recommendations from the borough president. First, um, you explained that the number of units had been reduced, the units had been re reconfigured in response to the borough president's request for larger units. And um, I just appreciate that um, um, move on the part of the applicant. The borough president, the Bronx borough president, has been particularly um, eloquent about the um, Real strains that the HPD approved sizes for um, these kinds of units provides for really creating healthy family life in these buildings, and I think it's great that the applicant has been um, willing to respond to that comment. Um, and the other question has to do with uh, including in the rezoning area the four um, one and two family homes up Colden Avenue. It was indicated at uh, a review session on Monday that city planning staff um, basically agrees with that request by the part of the borough president, and I wonder if that's okay with your client to remove those um, four so buildings. As a matter of public record, the applicant maintains no interest in any of those four properties. So of course when we uh, approach the department with regards to rezoning, the rationale is carefully discussed, particularly with regards to land use and context. And so for this particular block, you're looking at a block which is very much divided. The six residential or residential and mixed use unit uh, properties towards the southern portion were selected here primarily because they were existing non-conforming and so those four lots were seen as a an opportunity for additional frankly affordable units and residential units to be added to the area so um, on the applicant side uh, you know, we understand context is important, and so we would never or did not here advocate for any type of adjustment with regards to the zoning district boundary. The community board has, has essentially come out with strong statements with regards to the fact that there are applicant, so there are non-applicant sites here, which may become development sites, and likely they do exist as soft sites on this block. But at the community board hearing, we were very careful to note to them that 
pursuant to context and the entirety of the land use rationale, it was important for us to maintain those units, uh, those 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 uh, those properties. The Bronx Borough President has additionally evidenced for its own reason that those properties be removed. Uh, in addition to the to the fact that we were happy to oblige the the larger units, which we feel is a you know a valid. Uh, a goal and policy. Uh, we understand that the Bronx Borough President has an additional policy, and that's to encourage uh, home ownership in the Bronx. Uh, in, in meetings with the Bronx Borough President's office, they are very, uh, very frequently will be, they will point out that uh, the Bronx uh, has very low home ownership percentages, and so they like to do what they can to maintain those. So um, while again the applicant um, uh, has no position with regards to their removal, we understand the community board and the borough president's recommendations, and so. So we understand that, that the commission has chosen to remove those. Other questions? Then thank you to the applicant team. Um, we will now have a speaker in opposition, Grace Lavaglio. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, I represent the Allerton Barnes Block Association, the Allerton International Merchants Association, the Bronx Park East Community Association. I'm the chair of the Neighborhood Advisory Board for the DYCD. I attend the Chancellor's Parent Advisory Council meetings. I'm a very involved person in my community. So first I'm going to read uh, from the Allerton Merchants, and I'll read from BPECA, and then we'll go from there from the Allerton Merchants. We are writing on behalf of the Allerton International Merchants Association Incorporated to express our opposition to rezoning the area of and surrounding 2714 Williamsbridge Road, which would not only allow for a nine-story bu apartment building with upwards of 30 units to be constructed, but would also open the doors to other contractors to do so within that zoning area. Other concerns that were brought up at the Bronx CB11 Land Use Committee meeting, which I also attended that, and at the full board meeting, uh, were that the increase of residents without proper parking in the new construct would add additional strain to an already congested area. Current residents are spending two to three hours some nights circling the area just to find a parking spot so that they can go home to rest. Not to mention our area schools are currently overcrowded and our community children deserve more than to have their education compromised by them being lost in overcrowded classrooms. It was abundantly clear at both meetings that the majority of the residents in the immediate and surrounding areas are absolutely opposed to rezoning of this area. Those that were not opposed were not from the area that would be affected by this change. We hope that the Department of City Planning will heed the voices of the community as we voice our opposition to the rezoning of 2714 Williams Bridge Road. And thank you for all you've done and taken the, the time to consider our request. Uh, respectfully, Jean DeFrancis, Chair, Larry Moriello, President, Veronica Castro, Secretary. Uh, from the Bronx Park East Community Association, which I'm also a member. On behalf of the Civic Association that Rafael Schweitzer chairs, I am expressing opposition to the rezoning on the half block area compromising or comprising 2714 Williams Bridge Road, which would make way for an eight to nine story 35 unit apartment building by the corner of Allerton Avenue and Williams Bridge Road. I, I attended the Bronx Community Board 11 Land Use Committee meeting where the developer presented their plans for the building and the lawyer. Uh, Ms. Lavaglio, oh. we would welcome your submitting the letters. Oh, I, so I they did can submit be distributed them. to the commissioners. Okay. Oh, I didn't are, know there was a time, sorry. <laughs> no, it's a three minute time limit. Um, but are well, there questions for Ms. Lavaglio? Yes, Commissioner Marin. Ma'am, I have a question. You, you made a statement regarding um, you read the Allerton Avenue bid and a statement of opening up for other contractors being able to maybe build other buildings. Was that statement made before the recommendation to remove the four lots was made? Uh, possibly, yes. I believe so. However, that does not change our stance because uh, besides opening up a, a domino effect where we get a bunch of developers now, they 
this you change rezone for one, then they want to rezone for everybody. We currently have rezoning. There's a rezoning issue on Blondell, which I'm not sure if this developer is part of. Uh, they're, they're looking to rezone and put an eight or nine story building there as well. And again, Blondell Avenue down in Westchester Square, we're having a fight with a road diet on Morris Park Avenue. They're putting in a uh, 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 Metro North Station on Morris Park, down on uh, around Van Est and the, over there. Uh, we have this one over here that wants to rezone near our area. We have other developers surrounding us, and we are not equipped to handle the congestion. The, first of the, the the traffic, it takes what should take a 10-minute ride or less from Allerton to the Bronx Park, the Bronx River Parkway now takes upwards of 30 minutes to an hour just because there's so much congestion there. That's number one. Number two, there's the parking issue. Because the city does not require developers to uh, produce parking because we're near a, a transportation hub, because there's a bus or a train or subway nearby, that gives them right to not have to build parking, which I think the city needs to reconsider that because that's that's been very detrimental in our area. Our area is put. We are a car-driven area, not a uh, bus and train. Yeah, people use the buses and the trains, but majority of people you have cars. They use their cars. We have homeowners. It's not. A, we have a lot of homeowners. Not a low homeowner rate. Homeowner rate. And also, I've been involved with the Department of Education for years, and um, we're fighting with them to lower class sizes. Currently, there is there are no middle schools. Middle schools are oversaturated. There's no plans to build middle schools. Everybody jumps on the bandwagon for pre-K and pre-this and, uh, um, you know, low-income housing. They like to use that phrase, or affordable housing, I should say. But they're... These are not these are not realistic. In somebody's world, they might be realistic, but in our world, they're not. Well, our our children are are swamped as it is, are overcrowded. There's no money for funding. Uh, the DOE keeps creating positions, administrative positions, instead of instead of creating that. But so there's there's a, a lot of problems surrounding us and in our point there. It's very but bad. If you could stick to the questions, though, that okay. are asked. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> it's all connected. From... Everything's, it's all connected. No, Everything is connected. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Other questions? Then thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Our next speaker in opposition will be Patricia Charles, and I'll just reiterate what the secretary had said at the beginning, that uh, speakers have three minutes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Patricia A. Charles from Community Board 11, and um, we're here to support anyone who wants to come in and build, but we are really asking for them to take in consideration what the neighborhood is in truly need of. We're, um, we're opposing the rezoning only because, like um, my constituent said, there is so much congestion and even though there are going to be some, uh, uh, I think, parking situations that will be available, it would not be enough to sustain all of the overflow that would be coming through our area and, and at, you know, for, for the people that actually live there and has lived there for so long, it's, it's a hardship on us as it is. Even though I don't live in that area, I'm down the street, I'm around the corner, but we work together as a community to support one another to help things that are really truly needed in our community. So as we, as the community board um, did vote down the rezoning of any projects, only because if we do for one, then it could be a disaster for us if we don't you know, agreed to do it for someone else. So there's a catch-22 where if we do, it's a problem. If we don't, it's a problem. So we're asking for um, everyone to understand our situation of the overcrowding, with the school overcrowding. I'm a retired um, educator as well. I just retired July 1st. But I still do what I need to do on the outskirts, because if it, they tie my hands one way, I have to be able to use, utilize my education and my heart my professional 
my human side of what's needed in our community. So we're asking you to look at those issues and try to make sure that if they were willing to build a parking garage, then that would be, it would be helpful for the community for you to build something of that na nature. So I thank you very much for listening. I hope you can understand our position. Well, thank you both for your service as an educator, but also for the service on the community boards. We have, we get so much useful information from members of the community who are willing to donate their time. We do try to help everyone, no matter whose family is trying to build, we're asking you to think, come into the community thinking about what's best for the community. Question for Ms. Charles. Mm -hmm. Commissioner De La Uz. Uh, Ms. Yes. Charles, thanks for being here. Um, since you mentioned uh, that that you and the community board aren't against development, but it's about ensuring that development is producing things that the community wants and needs. I'm wondering if you could share, or if you, ha if the community board has shared with this development team, the top two or three things that the community board believes that are needed, um, and whether it's been shared with this development team or shared in, through other means, through your district needs statement, what some of that is so that um, making sure that it's, it's heard. Well, I myself, had, you know, knowing that the families are in the neighborhoods for years as well, um, and their best interest is to, you know, to stay there and be a part of the community because the elders have passed on and the younger generation are here to, you know, to, to keep the family's business in, in the area. Um, we've asked, you know, that they do provide some type of parking, which is necessary, and they, even though they have um, a, a certain amount, maybe 16 slots, those slots would still be for those who work in that building and not for the, the community, but it's a first come, first basis, and that wouldn't be fair to the people in the community that live there for, for so long. So now if there's more overcrowding that the families are, and they don't have anywhere to go, but they feel that they are pushed out because they won't be able to handle the overflow of more high-rise, even if, if it's only nine floors, the amount of apartments that are gonna be coming in, it's kind of like a, a, a hardship for those who are already there. And wherever the other families who deserve a, a roof over their head would like to come in from, it's not where it's helping the uh, the, the seniors, the elders, the, the, the schools that are um, there as well. So, I mean, there's, uh, in, in certain areas, they, they have like buildings that have actually blocked certain window space. They've made a cubicle, if there's a cubicle, and the way they build the, these apartments, is that's another address of where we're asking for them to build it to where you can put more besides just a twin bed and a dresser or things of that nature that that I see that are coming up now because I go visit these areas and, I, and, and it's alarming because when back in our day, the, the rooms were spacious and if you're going to let us know how much money you're spending for the materials, the quality of the materials, and how these things are being, uh, you know, built. And you have the, you have a reasonable way of explaining how, why you're going to charge me $700,000 for a home or an apartment, then, then you have officially let us know that you went the whole nine yards to build and appropriately to support the whole family and not just Thank you. to bring Dollars. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, it seems like at least a piece of um, what you're saying, uh, the borough president, I think, tried to address in his recommendation. I don't in know terms if the borough president did, but I know our community board did. So this is what we're asking to, for you to, to listen to. Okay. <clears throat> Anyone else? Other questions for Ms. Charles? Again, thank you for your testimony. Thank you so very much. We love family, and that's what we're trying to support. Thank you. Those are the only people who have signed up to speak on this matter, but if there are others present who would want to be heard, now is the time. Madam okay, Chair. The public hearing is closed. Madam Chair, oh, sorry, I had yes. one quick question. Oh, yes, of for course, Commissioner Rumpershaw. Uh, with regards to the applicant, the site plan, if they pull it back up for a second, the site plan we're looking at, I don't see the, uh, the stairs or the ramp, so just for future reference in case they resubmit, if they can please uh, add that to the site plan. Great, we'll pass that along and then address it in post-hearing follow-up. Thank you, sir. And with that, the public hearing is closed. Okay. <clears throat>
Borough of the Bronx, calendar numbers 23 and 24. Calendar number 23, CD1, C190143, ZMX. Calendar number 24, N190144, ZRX. A public hearing in the matter of application for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning Betances 6. We're going to have a 10 minute presentation by the applicant team, which is comprised of Spencer Edwards, Arivelka Cordova, Don Flagg, for questioning, Carol Gordon, Mike McCarthy, and Ernesto Vela. Good morning, Chair Lago and Commissioners. My name is Spencer Edwards, representing the applicant, the New York City Housing Authority. NYCHA is seeking a zoning map amendment to rezone the development site at East 146th Street and Willis Avenue in the Mont Haven neighborhood of the Bronx from an R6 C14 overlay to R7X C24 overlay, as well as a text amendment to establish MIH option two at the development site. The proposed actions will facilitate a 15 story building featuring 100 affordable housing units, one superintendent unit, on site social services, and ground floor retail. I'm joined by representatives from the development team um, who will provide additional detail and be available to answer any questions you may have. In alignment with the mayor's housing plan, NYCHA is ground leasing underutilized land to support the creation of affordable housing. Under this program, NYCHA residents will have a preference for a portion of the new apartments, and NYCHA will not pay for the construction, operation, or maintenance of the new building. After releasing the Make Mott Haven Transformation Plan in 2014, NYCHA and HPD jointly issued an RFP for the site in 2016 and selected the development team led by Lemley Wolf, Alembic Community Development, and The Bridge in 2017. I'll now turn it over to Annabelka Cordova from Lemley Wolf to further discuss the project highlights. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Annabelka Cordova, and I'm with Lemley and Wolf Companies. Here, I just want to go uh, an overview of the development team. The project will be developed through a joint venture partnership between Lemley and Wolf Companies, the bridge, and Alembic Development. Think Architecture is our project architect, who you'll hear from shortly. So here I'd like to summarize some of the key project highlights. The project will include an on-site social service program that will be operated by the bridge. The bridge has secured a New York, New York 3 social service contract from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene that will provide on-site social services for formerly homeless individuals with special needs. The project will include hiring targets and will also offer NYCHA residents and local community members job training opportunities. On the leasing side, there will be preferences for community board members and NYCHA residents. We believe the project will help meet some of the community development goals outlined in the Make Mount Haven, Mount Haven Plan with the creation of approximately 8,500 square feet of modern and accessible commercial space and by offering affordable housing opportunities for families. The building will include several green building features, including green roofs and open space. It will also meet Enterprise Green Community certification. The building will provide 101 units of housing. 30% of the units will be set aside for supportive housing. The remaining 70% non-supportive units are designed for larger families. We have 24 two beds and 14 three beds, which represent 54% of these non-supportive or the non-supportive housing units. The units will be primarily affordable to low-income individuals and families, as well as middle-income families. Based on preliminary underwriting under HPD's term sheets, the current target is to have 90% of the units affordable up to 60% AMI and 10% up to 80% AMI. We are in the process of reviewing alternate affordability scenarios that would result in more units at lower AMI bands based on some feedback from elected officials. Permanent affordability for 30% of the units will be obtained under MIH option two, and for the remaining units, we will be subject to extended affordability requirements for a minimum of 16 years. I'm oh, sorry, 60 years. Thank you. Um, the project is expected to be financed through HPD's extremely low and low income affordability program, which is paired with HTC tax exempt bond financing and 4% tax credits. The project will also look to qualify for a 420C tax abatement. 
Um, just quickly on the hiring plan, um, the development team will work with NYCHA and local community partners, including the community board, to market 15 construction jobs, which represent 30% of the new jobs that are expected uh, to the project to generate. In addition, the team will market six permanent jobs. Job training opportunities will be offered, as mentioned, and we're in the process of finalizing the plan and going back to the community board and providing regular updates on that. Um, so here we just want to highlight again the that we have an experienced social service provider with a great track record who's also a co-developer partner. Uh, the bridge will provide case management services for the formerly homeless individuals that demonstrate an ability to live independent uh, in independent housing. The staff will include a program director, a case manager, and peer specialist. In addition, the in addition to the staff, the project will have security guards during non-business hours. <coughs> With that, I'll turn it over to Don, who will go over the design. Good morning. I'm Don Flagg with Think Architecture. Uh, on this slide, you can see on the, on the right-hand side is the view from, from the southwest, looking up Willis Avenue and, and 146th Street. Uh, uh, on the upper left uh, uh, image is the, you can see the NYCHA building uh, in the foreground, which is at 147th Street, uh, also on the zoning lot. Uh, below that is the residential entrance, and below that is the, is the corner retail at the ground floor of Willis and 146th Street. Um, this is the, the site condition. Uh, there's the site is one story uh, commercial building, and, and the upper photograph you can see the NYCHA building in the distance, and the image below that shows a uh, close up of the one story uh, commercial building on 146th Street. The, uh, the zoning change map, uh, the existing zoning is shown on the left, and the proposed uh, zoning change on the right uh, with an R7X uh, district with a C24 commercial overlay. Uh, and here is the proposed uh, mandatory inclusionary housing map. Um, there's the massing of the building. <clears throat> that shows the strategy of the design, which is to locate the, a slender tower at the south side of the property in an effort to uh, minimize the shadows that would fall on the NYCHA building and the playground that exists just north of the NYCHA building between the two, the two buildings. Um, and you can also see that the uh, building is stepping down to the north with, with green roofs. Um, that uh, uh, descend towards the uh, the playground just immediately north of the building. Um, here's the, the site plan to orient to the uh, proposed building on the lower left and the NYCHA building on the top of the drawing, and you can see the uh, the green roofs as well. Here is the uh, the cellar level, where in light blue you can see the commercial space uh, that is connected to the street level commercial by a stair and handicapped uh, accessible elevator. In amber are the community, uh, the residential amenities, including a laundry room with a play area for children, uh, storage, and bike storage. And on the uh, first floor is, in light blue, is the commercial spaces um, fronting on Willis Avenue in the corner at 146th Street. In light green is the program offices for the bridge and in the, in the lobby of the building, um, which you can see here in a three-dimensional drawing, um, uh, on a, there's a vestibule to the left of the vestibule is the program offices, which uh, augment the security with a 24-hour presence, uh, and stairs on the right-hand side of the drawing that, uh, contributing to active design leading to the community room at the second level. Um, that, that community room opens out onto this terrace which has a green roof at the north side of the building and this uh, gathering space um, of about 900 square feet with um, a trellis and planting uh, amenities. And here is the south elevation facing 146th Street. Uh, the, the entrance to the building is on the lower right. You can see that the design of the building is, is articulated as two masses with the lower mass aligning with the adjacent properties. Uh, and the upper mass is separated by um, a, that gray area, which is a two-foot setback, sort of uh, creating um, a, a variety and interest in breaking up the mass of the building. Uh, on this 
drawing, we can see that the the uh, the relevant mayoral overrides, which is first of all, we are at 145 feet, which is permitted under the R7X zoning. Uh, we are also showing 15 floors instead of 14, which is uh, an issue that requires mayoral override, along with um, setbacks at the um, at Willis Avenue. We're, uh, we're proposing a mayoral override in order to intrude on the setback on Willis Avenue and at 146th Street, which you can see here on the, on the right-hand side of the building. Um, you can see the articulation of the, of the recessed uh, area of the building, sort of diminishing the mass of the building and uh, are, are making a contextual um, environment or a contextual response to the, to the neighborhood. Thank you. And that concludes our <laughs> presentation. <laughs> On the button. Yes, Commissioner Marin. Good morning, team. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I want to address two questions, maybe three, on the supportive units. You mentioned that 30% of the units will be supportive units, and then under population served, you identify 30 homeless individuals. So is it assumed that the 30% of supportive units will serve only individuals? Yes. There are um, studios and one-bedroom apartments, and they will only serve um, single individuals. Okay. My second question is pertinent to the lottery, and you mentioned that they will make every effort to have NYCHA residents part of the preference for lottery. Understanding the lottery by HPD, 50% preference goes to the community board, so how do you anticipate that you will include the NYCHA residents in that pool? So. Um the marketing plan is still several years out, but is anticipated at this point in time that 5% will be set aside for mobility dis uh, disabled applicants, 2% for hearing and visual, uh, and then the 50% preference is broken down. Essentially, 25% will go to NYCHA residents, uh, and then within that 50%, the other half would be for community residents. Will that be codified somewhere? Uh, this will be formalized in the next couple of years as the as the building is constructed and the marketing plan is finalized. Um, so. Um, we can provide additional information um, to the commission prior to your vote, if that is helpful. Um, but yeah, this is the preliminary understanding is that um, it'll be as I just stated. And the last question, I, I, even though it doesn't fall within purview, has to do with the design. So on, on one of the renderings, you show the up floors, windows sort of um, reflective and juxtaposing each other. And then another rendering, you show them in line with each other. So which one is it do you think it will wind up being? Or, or, or are the different facades being treated differently? The different facades are being treated differently, if I understand your question. Um, is this the drawing you're referring we have, to? That's one drawing. There's another drawing where they all line up. So I'm just trying to figure out which one is it going to be. That's all. Um, there's uh, another. Um, the, the windows uh, alternate as you go up the building. Okay, um, so that is the final design. <clears throat> yes, it is. Thank you. Knuckles. Thank you. I appreciate that this is uh, planned to be 100% affordable. I'm just curious as to um, neighboring buildings. Is there anything approaching 140 feet in the immediate vicinity of this? Uh, there are buildings to the south that are that are uh, tall. I don't recall the height of those buildings, but there's several blocks south. There are some. Uh, to all residential buildings. We can, we can provide further details on that um, if that's helpful, but also we, we know there's another um, building that's under construction um, in the north on 146 and St. Anne's, which is also uh, another tall building that's going up and went through 100% affordable building that's also in, under construction, but we'll provide other details about the neighboring, the height of the neighboring buildings. Thank you. Commissioner De La Luz. Um, I, I know that right now the proposal just includes mapping option two. Considering that you are um, in discussions, uh, I, I guess, with local elected officials about um, reducing the AMI levels, um, do you anticipate that that may impact the desire of the team to map option one and two? We're definitely open to, to find to have the final application um, be mapped in, in a way that aligns closer to what the final AMIs are. Um, I think the original proposal was just aligned with, um, you know, maximizing the permanent affordability option floor area of the building. So yes, we would be looking to do that. 
Great, thank you. And um, I, I just want to follow up from the gentleman from NYCHA. You know, you offered to provide more information on the lottery. I would welcome that. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you to the applicant team. We will now turn to a speaker in opposition, Yanni Hernandez. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Lago and member of the commission. My name is Jenny Hernandez. I am cleaner at commercial division. I um, have been um, 32 VJ for 12 years. I am here today on behalf of my union to testify on Langley and Worth Company, the bridge um, Alembic Community Devel Development Purpose Development uh, 424. 72 and 424 Willis Avenue. As you know, 32VJ represent more than 80,000 property service workers in New York City. All members clean and maintain buildings like the ones proposed. This development will provide important employer employment opportunity for the surrounding community. And we believe that the jobs is great, should give worker security and dignity. We full support the development and affordable housing, particularly development that is 100% affordable like Betansek sees. We are happy to report that development teams for this project has been in touch with, and we are hopeful that there will be a mainful commitment to provide good building service job consistent with area standards. Working families and the broader Bronx community deserve both housing and jobs that allow them to live with dignity and mobility. We are hoping the city and NYSHA will help ensure that the, this development provide building service worker with real economic opportunity. We respectfully urge you to recommend that development team for this project come in to good job apart or your recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Hernandez. Thank you. Thank you. Those are the only folks that have signed up to speak on this matter, but if there's anyone else who would like to testify, now is the time. Okay, the public hearing is closed. <coughs> Bar of Manhattan, calendar number 25, CD9, C180404, PCM. A public hearing in the matter of an application for the site selection and acquisition of property concerning Frank White Memorial Garden. This hearing will be continued to January 9, 2019. Okay. You can There's no one present for this hearing, and so it will be continued, as Madam Secretary said. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Borough of Queens, calendar numbers 26 and 27. Calendar number 26, CD6, C180447, ZMQ. Calendar number 27, N180448, ZRQ. A public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning the former Parkway Hospital rezoning. We will have a 10-minute team presentation. The team is comprised of Eric Polotnik, Tim Henze, and Brian Newman. This is not working. Can I have a moment with the flock? It's not working. Okay, I'll just use my timer. <laughs> the clock is not working. Oh. That's okay. This doesn't seem to be clicking either. If I'm, maybe I'm putting the wrong button. It takes a while. Oh, okay. okay we got Thank it. You. Thank you. You ready? I'm ready whenever you are. Okay. Start. Up. 
there it goes. We have it. it came up. Good morning. Thank you for uh, hearing our presentation. My name is Eric Palatnik. Uh, I'm an attorney. I know many people here, and it's nice to see everybody. Happy holidays, first of all. Uh, it's quickly approaching. The next week at this time, we'll all be ready for it. Uh, today, we're ready for housing in Queens, in Forest Hills. We have a really exciting project for you uh, that hopefully you've heard about. Uh, it's the old Forest Hills Parkway Hospital. It's been derelict for more than a decade. Uh, it's, it's been the subject of an arsonist, uh, it's been the subject of graffiti, and it's been really rotting away. Uh, it's located, it's tucked into an R12A zoning district, uh, which if you look at it in the center of your screen right there, you'll see that there are taller buildings surrounding it. We're asking you for permission to rezone the entire site that you see outlined in yellow there, and to make the front portion that has the former hospital on it into an R7X zoning district, and to rezone the rear portion of the property to uh, I'm missing my note for that, and I apologize to an R, what is it, an R9 in the back? R7A. R7A, I messed up the two. An R7A in the front and an R7X in the back. Uh, if you grant us this appro approval, that'll give us the ability to create a fully affordable senior development on the Parkway Hospital building. We'll be adding two floors to the six-story building. It'll be a total of eight stories when it's done. It'll have 135 units. It'll be a consistent, include 62 studios, 73 one bedrooms, and it'll be affordable under option four of the MIH program. The reason we chose option four, and I'll touch on that right away, is because we've worked very closely with the councilwoman, Karen Kozlowitz, to achieve the development that we're creating here today. Uh, Ms. Kozlowitz, or Councilman Kozlowitz, was very insistent on the, tar the target AMIs that she was trying to achieve. In her district, there are AMIs that support 70 to 80 percent AMI to 90 percent, even up to 115 percent. Here, we average at 95 percent AMI. And the other thing that's important to focus upon when we talk about this application is we're not using any government money to build this development at all. The concept behind the build the development is that the tower portion that we're asking to build, which I'll show you in a second, will subsidize the affordable component. So that is, uh, there will be a 421A component to it, but that is uh, the only government funding. Going through the project a little bit more, so you can familiarize yourself now that you have a background, uh, this gives you some imagery of the Parkway Hospital building uh, that you were looking at from an aerial perspective a few moments ago. Uh, as you could see, the building is rather derelict, and going around the site, you can see the proposed zoning districts here. The R7A district is what I mentioned earlier where I missed up the districts, and R7X on the back. Uh, the R7X on the back calls for the 14-story building, and what we'll talk about a little bit more as I go through it is that portion of the lot fronts up against the service road of the Grand Central Parkway. So the idea, again, is that even though we are wedged within an R12A district, we're really on the edge of it, buffered by the existing hospital that's six stories tall that we're adding on to, and the taller building, which is taller than other buildings around it, is not impacting the surrounding community because it is set back from all the lower buildings around it. Uh, this gives you the tax map, so I'll click right through this, and this you've seen. Uh, this gives you some imagery of the building. Uh, right here, you're looking at the senior housing development. Uh, the portion up until the setback is the existing six-story building. The two stories are being added up on top of that. Uh, that building will have services dedicated to both developments, as will the glass tower. But this building will be very specialized in the sense that it'll provide senior care facilities within it, meaning that there'll be a recreation room. Well, in the recreation room, there'll be senior programs that'll be offered within the recreation room geared towards the seniors. There's rooms downstairs that have more flexibility that could have visiting doctors come in and visiting nurses come in. Uh, there'll be a shuttle bus that operates from the site, from the Parkway Hospital side of the property where there's a driveway uh, where residents can go to the subway stop, which is approximately four blocks away at Queens Boulevard. We are not very close to the subway stop, so it is not an easy walk to the subway. That is why we're proposing to have shuttle buses. Uh, going through the development a little bit more, this brings you to the 14-story side of the building. Uh, what you're looking at at the bottom is, uh, is the ground floor. There is no retail, but what we're showing you there is there is a driveway to pull off of from the service road where residents can drop off their guests and, and have visitors uh, come in, and that's also where the entrance to the parking garage will be. The development will have a total of 180 parking spaces. It's only required to have 149 parking spaces. So we are slightly overparked for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is PS196, which is next door to us, which is having extreme problems with parking in the area, and we are dedicated to working with them to alleviating some of that. Uh, we're scheduled to meet with them in a few weeks. Uh, 
This takes you through the plans, which is the numbers which you obviously can't read. Uh, but here, this uh, in the center gives you an aerial shot uh, of the development with the Parkway Hospital, former senior, former hospital, senior proposed senior building at the bottom, and at the top is the 14-story tower. Uh, but what, in between them, you see there's a garden area which mimics the rest of uh, Forest Hills, which has this sort of layout between buildings. As you look between the buildings in Forest Hills, you'll see that there's open grassy courtyard areas interconnecting between all the buildings. We're maintaining the spirit of that, and that also provides a beautifully landscaped recreation area for both residents of both buildings to share and utilize. Uh, this, the plans, again, are just uh, black and white here, but giving you an idea of everything and showing you here where the parking is located at the cellar level. Excuse me, this is the parking level. Uh, and that is our presentation. There is not much more that I could tell you. I'd like to open it up for questions. And uh, we have our project team here as well. Questions? Commissioner Deleuze. You anticipated my question, so you, you preempted it by, by talking about the conversation that you had uh, with the local council member about option four. I guess, um, I mean, I, I certainly appreciate, I, I, don't, I don't know this community board um, except by looking at uh, various research reports from NYU Furman Center. And, you know, I guess I have a number of concerns about a project that um, has AMI levels that are as high as it is, um, that are targeted to seniors, given that, um, you know, there's just a, a really significant percentage of the local population that will not be eligible for the units. Um, and I, quite honestly, I'm a, I would hope that the development team has some concerns about the marketing and the lease up of it, um, given what you're talking about. So I would be ho I'm hopeful that you've um, done significant research uh, specifically about the need for seniors um, at those AMI levels and whether or not the project, um, how long it might take to, to lease up um, in order to, to meet your goals. Um, and yeah, obviously you'd be able to lease it up a lot faster if you lowered the AMI levels, given what I'm looking at at the NYU Furman Center reports. And thank you for your comment. And we did anticipate, you're right, we anticipated your comment, but you, you gave us a head start because you made the comment at the review session. So we, we sort of had a little bit of a, a knowledge of what your question was going to be. So we did try to anticipate that and present as much as we could in my presentation. But to go a little bit deeper, and Tim Henze is going to speak here in a moment. Uh, he did the affordability matrix on, on the application. Uh, what I would like to tell you, though, is it wasn't just taken ad hoc to come up with these affordability levels. Uh, this is a very unique project in the sense that I know of no other model in the city where it's a fully privately sponsored senior affordable development. Is everything else requires upon some form of state or federal funding in order to do it. So that component, when we approached Karen Koslowitz, when we sat with Karen and we said we wanted to do this on, do something on this property. And of course, we didn't even walk in the door with senior on this. We can't be that. I'm not giving us that much altruistic credit. We came in with something that was more aggressive from a, from a capitalistic standpoint. And Karen turned around and said, not in my district are you going to do that. I need seniors. She gave us the demographics that she's trying to achieve, knowing that she can't reach the demographics that you were just speaking about through this type of project. So what the, the, the consensus that we came to was this was making the best out of what's available out there to achieve what we can achieve, given that we there is no funding source to achieve the levels that you're trying to achieve. Now, having said that, we didn't just go from that level and then say, okay, let's build a building ad hoc. We went out and we did a marketing study, which we worked again with Karen's office uh, for about eight months, where we went out and uh, the result of it, which I'll just uh, give you an idea of it, is that according to the market data that we studied in this community board, households that are 55 and over uh, with incomes over 75,000 make up 59 percent of the elderly population. Uh, so the data we got, uh, uh, it, it goes on to say that incomes over $100,000 make up 43 percent of the senior population. Uh, and then it goes on to state, this is projecting out, by the way, to 2021. It goes on to state that there will be a six, there will be 16,636, I guess play the number six in lotto, senior households 55 and over with incomes over $50,000. So it's I'm trying to, we anticipated your question. We spent a lot of time trying to give you the information now at this hearing. Uh, and Tim might not even need to speak if you're satisfied, but I'm hoping that shows you that even though we're not, we're not plugging every hole on the boat, but we're plugging the holes that, that we can. 
I think you answered the question in that, that I think the biggest difference between what you just gave and the data that I'm looking at right now is that you're looking at 55 and over versus 65 and over. Uh, um, 62 and over, yes, yeah, which is I mean, what the, this would be, yes. Right, because, uh, I mean, obviously, you're talking about working age seniors um, who are still earning money and can, can afford these kinds of rents as opposed to seniors that are then on a fixed income um, when their their circumstances change. So if that's if that's the target population, um, I I hear you. On it's that it's point. a problem, and, and I think it's a definition of what a senior is in this case. Yeah, you know, I'm getting too close. <laughs> Other questions? Then we will thank the applicant team. Thank you. Happy holidays again. And we will turn to a speaker in opposition, Zamir Khan. Good morning, Chair Lago and members of the commission. Uh, my name is Zamir Khan. I work in the Upper East Side of Manhattan as a doorman. I've been a member of 32BJ. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I've been a member of 32BJ for the past nine years. Uh, as you heard previously, we represent over 80,000 members uh, who are all members in the service industry here in New York City. Uh, like many New Yorkers, we're concerned about the rising costs of housing in our neighborhoods and throughout the city. We're here today to ensure that the community uses all of the tools at its disposal, at its disposal so that the people who live and work in Queens can afford to remain and live with dignity. As you know, we believe that in order to create a more equitable New York, developers should commit to providing good building service jobs that pay families sustaining wages and give workers dignity. Auburg Grand Central LLC, an affiliate of Jasper Venture Group, has expressed an interest in providing prevailing wage building service jobs at this site and have reached out to us here at 32BJ. We're looking forward to what we hope will be a productive conversation about ensuring high standards for workers at this site, and we'll keep you updated on our discussions. Before it closed, Parkway Hospital was an important source of economic opportunity, and both the local community board and Pearl President Katz expressed a desire to see the proposed development at the site give workers a path to mobility. We respectfully urge you to recommend that Auburn Grand Central LLC commit to prevailing wage jobs for building service workers as part of your decision on this project. Thank you for having us, and have a happy holiday. Questions for Mr. Khan? Thank you. Thank you. And those are the only folks who have signed up to speak on this item, unless there is someone else who would want to be heard. So the public hearing is closed. Madam Secretary, anything else on the agenda? No, Madam Chair. Then I will, before closing the meeting, just add that I look forward to seeing everyone in the new year. Wow. <laughs>